So welcome and good evening everybody. I'm Dr Charlotte Summers, a clinical academic in intensive care medicine at the University of Cambridge and I'm one of the chairs of this session along with my colleague Dr James Davies who's an MRC clinician scientist at the University of Oxford. Evening everybody. Um, I'm the chair of the external affairs committee for the Association of Physicians uh, and we're delighted this evening to have a really quite stellar programme of people to talk to you about building resilience um, in clinical academic careers in a time of COVID. Uh, and as part of that, we've got a variety of speakers from all levels of academia. Um, well, hopefully we can have an interactive panel discussion at the end. The session is going to be recorded this evening unless any of you object. And if you do, now would be the time to speak up via the question and answer or chat function. Um, so that those who cannot be with us this evening will be able to later access the talks via our YouTube channel so that we can make sure that the benefit of the rich discussion I hope we're going to have is more widely shared across the community. Um, and with that I'm going to hand over to James who's going to introduce our first speakers. Yes, thank you Charlotte. So um, to start with we've got um, a couple of case vignettes um, uh, outlining the challenge that COVID sort of brings to academic careers. And um, first up is Dr. Paul Colony, Colony sorry, who's a, a clinical research fellow at the University of Glasgow. And um, uh, so I'm delighted to hand over to him for the first five minute presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully you're all seeing my presentation. So I've been asked to give a short case for Jeanette uh, about scoping the challenge of clinical research during COVID. Uh, so my PhD largely focused on looking at the interaction between sex, gender and cardiovascular risk. And in particular, my uh, clinical research uh, focused on the vascular effects of sex steroids in people who are transgender. To do this, we, had, uh, we were recruiting participants into a study if they had received hormonal therapy for five years or more. We were doing non-invasive uh, vascular assessments, looking at their arterial stiffness, their endothelial function, looking also at the microvascular function and atherosclerotic assessment via CIMT. And with that, also doing a variety of uh, biomarker analysis, for instance, looking at thrombin generation to assess how coagulable these patients are, and lastly, looking for any RNA expression associations with these vascular phenotypes. However, about eight, eight months into uh, recruiting into the study, and we were starting to get some interesting data back, COVID had quite a significant impact upon this uh, clinical research study and really presented a number of research barriers that uh, really impeded progression. So these were essentially, there was a reduction in recruitment opportunities. A lot of non-essential clinical activity was halted. And as a consequence, we weren't able to uh, recruit patients at uh, endocrinology clinics. There was the closure of our clinical research and laboratory facilities, which of course really impeded us from uh, bringing these patients or participants in to, to undertake the vascular assessments or doing the biobarker analysis. And lastly, myself and I'm sure a number of fellows throughout the UK were also redeployed back to NHS service and I was deployed back for a period of three months which obviously impacted their ability to undertake research at that time. But as they say when one door closes another opens and COVID-19 has presented some opportunities uh, for advancing our clinical research and in order for me to complete my PhD and in particular, this is a consequence of new collaborations that were formed as a consequence of COVID. We've moved from doing clinical research to undertaking a large data analysis project. We're collaborating with the Institute of Wellbeing at the University of Glasgow, in particular, uh, Professor Vital. And we have gained access to the clinical practice research data link, uh, which is a very large longitudinal uh, database that we're able to look at the, the, the cardiovascular uh, phenotypes, essentially, or cardiovascular risk of people who are transgender over a period of time. And we're starting to get some very, very exciting data from that, which will ho hopefully have quite a significant clinical impact for these patients in the future. We've also collaborated with a, a Professor Louise Pilot at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, 
McGill University has uh, established biobanks uh, of tissue in relation to a study looking at uh, the relationship between sex, gender and cardiovascular risk. And we're utilising uh, blood samples that were stored in that biobank in order to, to look for uh, microRNA expression, uh, which will be done in Glasgow. And lastly, uh, another opportunity that's presented itself, the clinical research that we do is often very time consuming. So time that's been freed up by COVID has been put to, put to use elsewhere. We've managed to publish systematic reviews uh, and editorials and uh, plan uh, further studies and even give, uh, we're preparing to give a talk in Kentucky uh, later in February with the data that we've collected from these kind of new collaborations. So I just wanted to, to end uh, with uh, some of my experiences. So although COVID-19 uh, presents many research challenges, I just wanted to highlight that it also uh, provides some opportunities, even if you're not looking at doing COVID-19 research yourself. Uh, I just wanted to offer some advice to any fellows or people who are considering doing a PhD in the near future, that uh, what you need is organisation. Uh, you need to uh, come up with mitigation plans if your initial research plan can't go ahead because of the, our current circumstances. You've got to adapt to those circumstances. Uh, and very importantly, yeah, and I think really is the key to research is collaboration. And I also just wanted to highlight uh, that uh, there's really a wealth of resources available out there that are already established and we can uh, look into these and uh, utilize them in your clinical research to move forward. And certainly that has been a very fruitful endeavor for us uh, in this research project. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I hope that hopefully that was helpful. Thanks, Paul. That was great. Um, so uh, the way that we're going to run the programme today is that we're not going to have questions in between the talks. Um, so if people can put questions uh, to Paul, if they're interested into the Q&A, that would be fantastic. Um, so next, we're going to move on to Ken Baker, um, and he's a clinical lecturer at Newcastle, and uh, he's a rheumatologist, and um, it'd be great to hear his kind of views on how COVID's affected his research. Great, hopefully you can see your white screen. <laughs> so I'm Ken Baker, I'm an NIHR clinical lecturer in rheumatology at Newcastle. And I thought to give some context to my presentation, it might be helpful if I just told you a bit about who I am. So I'm the happy chappy in the middle. Um, and because I'm a NIHR clinical lecturer, I spend 50% of my time at the local uh, NHS uh, trust and the rest of the 50% of the time at the university. And bridging the two organisations is the uh, NIHR Newcastle Biomedical Research Centre, uh, which has also been funding and supporting my research work. Um, and for me, COVID hit actually quite late in my training. So having started rheumatology uh, single accrediting training in 2013 as a clinical trainee, I then took some time out of programme for, for research, so a four year MRes and PhD programme. Um, briefly going back into clinical training uh, after my PhD and then being fortunate in securing the clinical lectureship. So COVID hit here. So for me, it was about nine months prior to my CCT at the end of this year. And as it happens, about eight years uh, after my last uh, general medical job. Um, and in the dark days of March with uh, COVID admissions escalating, and mass redeployment on the cards. Um, I wasn't quite sure that I was able to contribute perhaps as much as my other junior colleagues towards acute medical care. Um, but what I have had is quite a lot of experience in terms of uh, clinical trials. So both during my PhD uh, and also in the period afterwards of designing and, and running uh, clinical trials. So after discussing with my supervisor, I actually directly approached um, uh, the deanery, our specialist training lead and said, uh, if there's any COVID research opportunities coming up, I, I'd like to be part of it. Um, and they called my bluff and the next week I said, we are setting up a COVID research team and we'd like you be, to be part of that. And um, so pretty much overnight, beginning of April, April Fool's Day as it happened, uh, I stopped becoming a rheumatology registrar and became uh, an honorary uh, infectious diseases registrar on the COVID research team. Um, and this was the work that we were doing that, that there's three main elements to it, that the bread and butter were the inpatient COVID-19 studies. Uh, so we were both screening and recruiting patients to these studies and then doing things like blood sampling and, and swabs, et cetera. Uh, and we recruited to quite big uh, international studies. So in the first week of the job, I've recruited about four patients, I think, to the ACT study, 
which was a study that showed the effectiveness of remdesivir. Uh, we also recruited many patients to recovery, which, as you know, showed the effectiveness of dexamethasone and the negative um, result for hydroxychloroquine. And we also recruited to the ISRIC cohorts, uh, the big observational cohort, which has led to the 4C mortality score, amongst others. Um, and as uh, local cases were, were dropping off towards the end of April, we were starting to rack up activity in terms of the Oxford uh, vaccine study. Uh, and that was a particular challenge, having not delivered a, a vaccine study in Newcastle before, to go from sort of ground zero up to uh, full scale vaccinating and screening uh, hundreds of healthcare staff in a matter of about two weeks was quite a Herculean effort. Um, and whilst we were uh, doing those other two other strands, there was also some data arising from our own local patients, and we were able to put that together into some local um, cohort studies. Um, so what were my feelings when I was taking part in this? It's about four months or so that I was redeployed for. Um, initially, when I started, there were two big clouds for me, really. One was personal risk. Uh, so I was going from quite a, you know, a protected environment in rheumatology outpatients to really being in the thick of it on ITU, et cetera, seeing the sickest COVID patients and what that meant in terms of personal uh, risk and was a big worry at the beginning. Um, also, there was, the, of course, the closure of the university laboratories, and I was um, just about to start a, uh, an AMS-funded uh, research project, and that's put the scuppers on that. It's only just starting this week, actually. Um, so there was uh, worry about how this would impact my career development. But with time, those worries faded away and, and, and were replaced by a lot of positives from the experience, actually. So first and foremost, I found it very rewarding uh, to be part of an international uh, research effort. Um, and you really did feel like you're making a difference. Research can sometimes feel a bit abstract, uh, but certain, you know, certainly it, it became very, uh, very um, uh, pertinent. And it just shows you the importance of clinical research, I think. Um, also being part of the supportive team helped me get through that um, period, both from doctors and nurses' point of view. Um, it did offer me an, uh, an opportunity to maintain a, a degree of academic output in what otherwise would have been quite a fallow research period. Um, but the main thing was that I found it very confidence building exercise. So being able to rely on these so-called softer skills that you know, always touted from a PhD, things like leadership and uh, responding to change and planning, uh, were very much had to uh, rely on those in this period of time. And being able to get through that period has given me confidence in looking forward to my own uh, future academic career. Um, and I just want to finish by thanking the people that made it possible. Uh, Chris Duncan, who's my supervisor uh, during the redeployment, um, Ashley Price, who's a, a force to be reckoned with in terms of all things ID and uh, ID research in Newcastle, uh, Aidan Hanrath, Anita, Shim van der Leuf, who were the other two uh, junior doctors on the research team, all the research nurses in Newcastle and the administrators, and of course, Health Education Northeast for supporting me in the uh, redeployment period. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, our next session, or the next part of this session, is around how COVID-19 has changed clinical academic training opportunities and pathways. And we're extremely fortunate to have Professor Sarah Marshall, who's the Head of Physiological and Clinical Sciences for the Wellcome Trust, uh, and Professor David Jones, who is the Dean of the NIHR Academy, to share their experiences with us as part of that. Um, first, we're going to hear from Sarah. Thanks very much, everybody, and um, it's great to be here uh, this evening. Um, so this is my title. Let's see if I can get this. And in fact, uh, much of my first slide has already been covered by Paul and by Ken, which is really about the opportunities that has been created uh, by COVID. And we've heard about local and national teams and networks that have been focused on COVID research and how this has created opportunities to get involved in mostly clinical research, but also discovery research as well. Um, what we're seeing as, as funders is that uh, there are obviously a number of new opportunities for personal research programs that have been created. But I just wanted to flag up, beware if you're writing a grant, beware the COVID add-on, you know, the work package five, which is that you're going to look at let's say T cell responses in COVID, which large consortia around the world are already doing. Um, I think that uh, COVID has created opportunities, but 
when you're thinking about your own COVID related research, it needs to be scaled to what you're um, able to deliver. It's also important to think about pivoting your existing research plans. Um, and it's important that everybody at this time review what they, they plan to do over the next, the short and medium term, and think about whether that is now feasible given the current limitations. Limitations not just of clinical research, but also of international travel. And so do review, if you have a fellowship at the moment, do review the elements of the fellowship. What do you need to change and where do you need to adapt? And do talk to your funder about this. Your funder will generally be very happy to consider um, a, 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 if you wish to make a major change in your plans. And Paul talked about the major change that he made to his PhD. Um, funders are always happy to hear about that in advance, and they may be able to provide useful advice as to how to do that. In terms of impact on funding pathways, there's a lot of uncertainty about how COVID is going to impact on, uh, on the funding pathways. We all know that the medical research charities have been very badly affected in terms of their funding streams. But I know that many medical research charities are prioritizing early career research funding uh, because they see how important it is. So um, there, there may not be um, the bad news that we fear along that path. We also have very strong UK government enthusiasm for science and it will be very interesting over the next months to see how that manifests. And of course, while there are COVID related changes, there are also other changes going on. And um, I know that many of you will be wondering about Wellcome's new strategy, which was launched 10 days ago. Um, I'm not actually going to discuss it in detail. Do ask me questions if you wish. It's really about watch this space and how that's going to impact on early career researchers. And we're really going to come out with some detailed news on that in the early uh, part of next year. And my last slide really, is about COVID memory and the funders. And as funders, we are really thinking quite hard about how to incorporate an, uh, an appreciation of the COVID-related disruption when considering new applications. The first thing to say is ensure that funders are aware of the disruption to your preparations. If you are submitting an application, there may not be a specific question, but there's usually a question on career contribution, which is free text, free words, always good to use. Your letters of support are another good place for people to comment on um, the fact that you may not have had the time or the facilities to do the preliminary work that you wanted. Now, at Welcome, we have a standard question in interviews, which is, is there anything else you would like to tell us? And that's a great opportunity to say, well, there were things I couldn't do in preparation for this. In terms of the form, do, do include information in the form, but be aware that GDPR does limit the kind of information we can hold in application forms. And so if, we, if you tell us too much, we may get back to you and say, do you mind removing that? Um, the other thing as funders that we're doing is we are briefing interview panels um, and or assessment panels, not just interview panels on the potential impact of COVID on preliminary work so that there is less emphasis on the need for preliminary data. But of course, these assessment panels do have to make decisions. So it's actually quite difficult to do, but we do make sure that that disruption of the early part of the year is really taken into account. And then the last thing I just wanted to say is be aware of some of the resources that have been set up to support people through, or support doctors through uh, the COVID period, and I'm particularly flagging the uh, COVID website that the Academy of Medical Science has set up specifically for doctors in terms of provision of support. So I hope that's useful and happy to answer any questions um, as part of the panel discussion. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we're now going to hear from Professor Dave Jones, who is the Dean of the NIHR Academy.
Hi, it's um, very difficult to do slick handovers on Zoom, I'm discovering. So, um, absolute pleasure to be here. I think this is a really timely meeting and um, very grateful for the Association of Physicians pulling it together. And uh, there are some themes that will already develop, and I think those should be very reassuring for people. So, um, I I'm going to talk about the NIHR's perspective on... Um, COVID and the issues that have arisen uh, and like everybody else very happy to take questions afterwards. Um, okay so I've split it into two one is the research impact and opportunity and then I'm going to touch on the issues around the clinical service and people's return to clinical work and I think there are some important things for people to be aware of uh, with that. So um, from an NHR's perspective, all our existing programmes uh, and training opportunities will continue unchanged. So we have not made any changes to our schemes uh, and we have some real flexibility to look after and support people as they go through that. So there are going to be uh, no changes to um, our offer that comes along. So all future calls will go uh, as originally planned. We delayed, I think correctly, uh, some of our interviews because of the acute uh, phase of COVID and we are now going to go back to our um, established timeline. We've moved fully to online interviews for all our fellowships. Um, we've now done both doctoral and advanced level fellowships uh, using online interviews and it's actually worked uh, remarkably well. And I have to say, I think these are actually a very fair way of interviewing people, perhaps a little bit less um, gladiatorial than a face interview. So um, that aspect has worked very well. So we continue to award, continue to run competitions, and that will continue um, uh, moving forward. My next point touches on comments that have been made, which is that if your research is about COVID, that's absolutely fine. Um, if it's not, don't make it about COVID artificially. Uh, Sarah's um, work package five, absolutely. We're seeing some shoehorning in uh, of COVID aspects into projects that where it doesn't really fit. Uh, and the very large international consortia are doing uh, much of this work. So if there is a natural fit, if it's odd not to talk about it, then uh, do include aspects around COVID, but don't feel you have to make it about COVID to pre please the panel. Um, do just watch out about lead times. Um, this has happened before with previous epidemics. There is a lead time for writing fellowships, setting them up and delivering them. And um, we don't know what's going to happen with COVID. We all heard about the vaccine yesterday. Um, remember fellowship applications now are to start in around about a year's time. And uh, you wanna make sure that there's still going to be a COVID project to do if, if COVID is the focus. So. Um, only make it about COVID if that's the right thing to do for the research. The next one is really important because many of the priorities that have emerged in COVID are very much areas that were of interest to NIHR. So we have a very broad remit around health of the, of the public and also social care, so public health, social care, obviously critical care, epidemiology, infectious diseases, vaccine development, some of the issues particularly around delivery and acceptance and take up of vaccines, obesity, BAME health are all issues that we were interested in and concerned about uh, before COVID. And of course, those are all factors that have been part of the COVID impact. So clearly there are a number of areas that I call post-COVID, which are perhaps moving on from the acute infectious disease and immunological phase into what it is about our population that made COVID such a problem and that we need to get to grips with. And these are all prime areas for NIHR. And I would expect to see significant applications looking at public health, social care, primary care, et cetera, responses in COVID and how we can do things differently. And I think that's a really major area of opportunity. And the comment about some studies will be made more difficult to have a plan B, I think has been covered you know, excellently by um, the speakers earlier on, where there's been some uh, very sensible use of opportunities. You stop doing something, there are other opportunities. And I can tell you now that's the sort of adaptability, flexibility that panels love when people go for interviews. You've used your academic nows to bring your skills into a different situation. So do think about a plan B. And then clinical duties and research training. Um, 
it's very important to say that we recognize absolutely that academic trainees made a very large contribution to the COVID, COVID clinical care in the spring. And this is both doctors, dentists, but also nurses, midwives and AHPs. And it's very important to say that we recognize that the numbers returning to clinical service were extraordinary and the contribution was extraordinary. It's also very important to say that all the funders and all the other interested parties have and are working together um, to minimise the impact on your training. And I think one of the most heartening things I've ever been involved with is that we put a statement out through the Royal College of Physicians committing to support academic trainees to do the right thing. And it took us an, literally an hour to bring all of the funders, all of the colleges, um, the GMC, um, Academy Medical Sciences, the BMA, uh, et cetera, et cetera, together to make that statement. We are working together. We continue to work together to look after your interests. And we are keen to minimise the impact on training. One of our pieces of work was around the August return to work, because when it became very quiet in the summer, it was very important for people to be able to return to their research. So this is the funders and other parties working together. And we are there in the background to help you. And we will continue to do that. As part of that, clearly there are plans in place for a second wave and have been all the way through. So we were working on this over the summer, what to do should this happen? And I think it was very important and we were asked by the trainees to learn the lessons from what had happened the first time around. Um, a lot of people made a, a big contribution, but some people felt perhaps underutilized and that had sacrificed research opportunity without being fully utilized in clinical duties. And so therefore there will be differences in terms of any call back to academic from academic to clinical service this time around. And um, as a starting point, academic trainees will not be returning to clinical duties unless in exceptional circumstances. Now, clearly this is dependent on your area of specialty, the metaphorical critical care lecturer, um, one can see the importance of that. But um, it will be made very much around um, the skills of the individual and the needs of the service. And we're very keen to avoid people backfilling um, perhaps vacancies that have been there for other reasons over a long period of time. And there was a tendency for that to happen a little bit the first time around. There is a formal escalation plan. It has been agreed with the Four Nations Deans. It's been an extremely productive exercise, um, the English, Welsh, Scottish and Northern Irish deaneries um, around this happens and there is an escalation plan. And if you are asked to go back to the clinical service, it is really essential uh, that you discuss this with your supervisor, who discuss it with the deanery team um, and where appropriate with the funders. And I would echo Sarah's comment, absolutely. We are here to help. We are there to look after your interests, please do discuss things with us. And it's really important is trust mustn't ask you unilaterally to go back into clinical service and you mustn't agree. There is a formalized process to go through before that happens. So um, if in doubt, discuss with your supervisor and then discuss with the deanery. And then just to echo the last point is one that Sarah made, which is that we understand completely the disruption. And so from now on, for the next X number of years, we will take account of lost time, lost opportunity when people are coming forward for our awards. So um, people are very worried about perhaps missing out on this paper or that paper from um, their existing work. There will be an opportunity to explain why that happened. Um, and so don't worry, um, that sense of how many papers you need will be adapted for as long as it takes so that people don't lose out. So really, I would just echo what everybody else has said. There are opportunities as well as challenges. People responded fantastically. We will continue to fund people to a significant degree using our existing schemes. Um, thank you for your contribution to the clinical service, um, but there is a plan to make sure that any disruption is absolutely minimal moving forward for the future. So at that point, I will stop. Thank you. That was uh, incredibly helpful. Um, that leaves me um, just to hand on to the next presenter. Um, and we're really grateful to have Professor Moira White, um, who's vice principal and head of the College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine at the University of Edinburgh who's going to talk to us briefly uh, about what she would do as an early career academic. So thank you very much, James, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm, I've rapidly been realising it's a mistake to speak last after such excellent colleagues because they've covered some of the things I wanted to say. But actually, it's quite challenging to take myself back nearly 30 years and think what I would have done 
in the situation of an early career clinical academic um, now uh, without the benefit of hindsight. But I have given it some, some thought over the last few months, obviously because I've been watching the impact on our own uh, medical school in Edinburgh. And actually, the, f the phrase that sums this all up best for me is actually a quotation from Dickens, uh, Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, because actually what's been so apparent to me is that for some people, the COVID-19 pandemic has given them great opportunity. For others, it's been a really significant struggle to balance all the things that they are, they were hoping to do and that they have to do as part of their lives. So there's no doubt that for some people it has been a huge opportunity. Um, I've seen people in the medical school who work in genomics, who work in data science, who work in inflammatory cell biology, who have seen huge opportunities in COVID and have been able to build on them rapidly. There's other people, and Paul gave a great example of that earlier, uh, where they were able to pivot their existing research skills to address a COVID-related question, and that's great. And to those people, I would say, go with the flow to make the most of your opportunities, but don't lose sight of your long-term goal. Remember what specialty you want to end up in and what the big scientific questions are that you want to answer, but otherwise, Good luck to you. I think for the people for whom it was, if not the worst of times, then really quite challenging, you know, you should take pride in what you have managed to do. You know, whether you had to contend with shielding, with looking after children, with your experimental plan going up in smoke, you know, whether because it was a clinical trial or you were doing long and complex animal experiments or whatever you know, stuff happens and what matters is how you deal with it. And, you know, it seems like a very momentous time and it's been a very momentous time, but when you look back from my advanced age, it will seem a very short period in your overall career. And actually I was about a year into my own PhD when I realized that actually if I'd stayed in bed for a year it probably wouldn't have made much difference in terms of publishable data and you know you have difficult times but you do recover from them. So what what would I say well we talked about being adaptable adaptable in terms of the science you can actually do adaptable in terms of when you can do experiments, how you can do them. You have to think about not what I intended to do when I wrote a fellowship application several years ago, but what can I actually do now? And it's very important to share that burden as well. So you're not on your own in this. There are many other people who've had similar challenges to address and you should work with your supervisors and mentors to think how you might rejig your plans and, and do things differently. You, you've also heard, I think, from, from others that, you know, the funders are really trying to, to be supportive uh, where they can. They've been supportive financially, but I know they're open to discussing people's individual um, needs and, and challenges with them, you know, to try and progress your career. I think most of all what I would say is I wouldn't let this derail you. I would stick to your long-term ambitions even if you have to make short-term changes because my experience you know over so many years has been that good people win through. You, you will all have undoubtedly shown considerable academic ability already by gaining access to academic training schemes, winning PhD fellowships, whatever. So you know that you can achieve things and you should just stick with it. So my overall message is a combination of flexibility around what is achievable, mentorship and seeking help from others, and then just stick with it 
and all of us, I think you will hear on this call, want you to succeed and we'll try and support you where we can. So I will stop there, having used my allotted time and we'll look forward to the questions. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Moira, uh, and to the rest of our panel members who I'm hoping will unmute themselves and turn their cameras back on so that we can have a discussion. Um, and I thought I would start the discussion based on some of the questions that have been submitted. Um, and where I thought we might start is there's a lot of anxiety about the funding landscape going forwards, with particularly the medical charities having shortages of funds um, as a result, result of the effect of the pandemic, particularly places like the BHF and Cancer Research UK, who've quite publicly said that they're struggling. There's a lot of concern coming through on the questions around how that might affect people's research prospects in the longer term and how to negotiate that. So I will start off because I chair MRC's Training and Careers Group. And Dave, it will be in a slightly similar situation in his NIHR role, because uh, what we're talking about is uh, contingent on the government's comprehensive spending review. But I don't think it will be a secret to say that MRC is absolutely prioritising uh, clinical fellowships, fellowships in general uh, for the next financial year, recognising uh, the difficulty uh, that people are facing. And similarly, uh, as Sarah has said, the you know, some of the charities are struggling, but where they can, they are prioritising um, funding for fellowships and they are recognising uh, the considerable challenges that people have uh, put up with. So although I don't think the concerns are groundless, I don't think the situation is as difficult as maybe people might be concerned it is but Sarah or Dave may wish to say more. Shall I comment? Um, so obviously I oversee the NIHR programmes and we have um, two seats at the table, if you like. One is our personal awards for doctoral and, and postdoctoral, but we also run um, IAT and then ICA, the equivalent for nurses, midwives and AHPs, which are the career pathway schemes. So the first thing to say for ACFCL, um, and for the equivalent schemes in nursing and, and allied health professions, those continue with no funding changes at all. So um, that aspect is, is unchanged. In terms of our personal awards, um, as Moira says, spending review um, is going to be instrumental. But again, um, a big priority for NIHR will be around um, training and personal awards. So we are looking to expand our fellowship numbers, not to contract them. And um, the, the case that we make all the time is that if, if times are tight in terms of money, it's really essential that you look after the bloodline of people for the future, because clearly people we fund um, to, to undertake a training fellowship are people who will then continue in science for 10, 20 or 30 years. So um, losing a generation of people is, is very harmful. Losing a generation of project grants is less directly harmful. So those are cases that we make and we're cautiously optimistic. Um, in terms of the charities, I think um, I'm acutely aware I'm a patron of a charity that does fantastically good work um, with patients and has been decimated during um, COVID and yet has continued to offer enormous amounts of patient support. So I do make um, the case repeatedly um, to very senior colleagues in the Department of Health that the charities are hurting. They're doing a fantastic job and they're a critical part of the really unique UK ecosystem. Um, and I would be hopeful that that will be acknowledged um, uh, in the spending review and action will be taken, but we'll have to see. But people are very, very aware of the very broad role played by the charities, which really are a unique feature of the UK system. Sarah, would you like to comment from the welcome perspective? I will. Um, so I think from, from welcome specific perspective, we've launched a new strategy and I think it's very important that early, to, to emphasize, early and mid-careers are uh, firmly embedded in that strategy. So we've not released a whole lot of information um, about the individual schemes yet, but the information on our website is very clear that there will be schemes for early and mid-career researchers. So that's a really important point to make. And we've also 
we're obviously big funders in the clinical PhD space. That's something we're looking at at the moment uh, in terms of our funding there. So there are, are going to be, um, I think, uh, exciting new opportunities within the welcome portfolio. Um, just one more point from us, which is that our number one area to expand um, where where resource to become available is in the mid career. So the advanced for us advanced fellowships, the postdoctoral stage, because that's where we think there is the greatest pressure. So we are. Um, it is in our plans to build on and expand that space. So um, I have a, a question from based around the questions that we've been asked. Um, clearly, the the way in which the funding landscape has been affected is is topic sent is topic dependent so particularly you know cancer based research and the bhf based research is is affected um do you think people should adjust their sort of research to proposals in light of that or, or are the funders going to be more flexible in terms of what they'll consider <laughs> can i comment um we um it's interesting uh, we're often told um, one of the things that interests us is the number of myths that arise around funders and what they do. And one of the things that we're collectively doing is, is we're going to launch a myth busting website to uh, to address some of these. So one of the ones I hear all the time is that NHR doesn't fund cancer. In fact, cancer is our largest area of investment um, and our second largest area is cardiovascular disease. So we already do fund a lot in, in, in those areas and will obviously continue to do it. The focus for NHR is around the health burden the health and social care burdens in society so to not invest in the areas of disease that are um the, the the biggest killers is a real problem the thing for us of course is that we're very much in the applied from from translational research through into practice and i think one of the areas we need to be aware of is the really major contribution made by cancer research cambridge heart foundation in the mechanistic biology and the drug discovery aspects and i think that is something it's much more difficult for us to to, to sort of backfill and just to follow up on what Dave said, uh, again, I don't want to make this about the welcome strategy, but the welcome strategy has highlighted three health challenges, which are mental health, climate change, and emerging infection. But it's also highlighted the importance of discovery research, which is the base for all of that. And so we will continue to fund in discovery research um, to meet that need that, that um, or to address the, the need that, that Dave has highlighted. I think from a broader question, that idea of should should I should one re, kind of refocus one's research uh, because of the current funding situation, I think that is is probably short sighted because usually one's research choice is because there is a question that you want to answer and you want to de develop those skills to answer that, and that's usually a long term project rather than something that's going to be um, delivered in the next you know, in, in the short term. So I would say no, but think about how you can develop the, the, the portfolio of skills that you need to address that key question. And also make sure your question is big enough so that it is applicable to other areas and it gives you flex and adaptability. Uh, I would just highlight something that Ken said, which I thought makes that point. So I absolutely wouldn't do what you love, do what you're passionate about, because you'll do it better. But I think Ken made a very good point, which is translatable skills. So if you're worried about an area and its longevity, learn skills that you can then use in another area. So Charles' methodology is a classic example of that, but data science is another. So don't go too esoteric in an area you're worried about. Keep the skills generic so you can move sideways if you need to. Uh, and maybe just worth briefly highlighting that there are schemes either currently in existence or about to come in that clinicians will absolutely be eligible for. So one example would be the UK Future Leaders Fellowships, which is a big new UK government funding stream that has been very little accessed by clinicians, but when clinicians apply, they often... You, well, they are more successful than non-clinicians proportionately. And there will almost certainly be a UK government announcement to replace European Union funding streams, which we've probably mixed feelings about, but actually it will bring a new funding opportunity. So there will be new streams of money 
that hopefully will compensate or indeed I think actually end up with there being more opportunities, particularly as Dave has highlighted and, and Sarah, that mid-career clinician scientist uh, level. Brilliant, thank you. We've talked a little bit about um, the impact of COVID on the funding landscape, but I speak now as a respiratory and intensive care physician. Um, there are a group of people for whom COVID is going to have had a greater impact on their research productivity over this year and probably next compared to people who may be in other less front line for this particular pandemic research areas. And I wondered how the funders are going to deal with that disparity in productivity over the next five or 10 years, because I suspect the impact for some people may be that long. Shall I comment? Mm, please. So um, one of the things is that the funders are smart and, and um, that th th we think very carefully about these things. So um, I think people worry about this, but we're very smart. Specifically for NIHR, one of the changes we made two or three years ago was to introduce strategic themes. So previously we were purely response mode. So we considered the applications we got and didn't prioritize at all. Uh, and of course, in a world where there are some real health challenges, those are changing very quickly. And, you know, Sarah's uh, highlighted some of those multimorbidity is a, a, a big issue for us, for example, as well. So what we are doing is investing in specific areas to um, to to almost ring sense friends funding to ensure that areas that are strategically important nationally are supported. And so that will be a tool that we use increasingly. Um, in fact, critical care had been a part of a, an acute care sort of theme for us prior to COVID. And of course, we can all see the benefits and values of it. And I, I'm incredibly proud when I see so many people who are involved in our efforts in this in from the academic side being you know leaders in the field talking about the clinical aspects it works really well so um, we will ensure that these areas that are nationally strategically important are are looked after NIHR is a little bit different to MRC and NHR we are part of the Department of Health and Social Care there is no political influence on what we fund but we are part of um, government, if you like, and it's beholden on us to make sure those areas that are strategically important for the nation are looked after. So that is that will be looked after as it works its way through. And I think for X number of years, as I said, we will take on on board the op the opportunities that have been lost by people um, as we move forward. So nobody, uh, I think we all came together and said nobody will be disadvantaged by this. We are holding to that. It's not always easy. Um, because it's a really, really challenging landscape, but but we will look after those. And I think if there are pressures in areas, then that's a dialogue that we continue to have. Um, Charlotte, I think I'm going to try and answer that question slightly differently. I mean, I agree with everything that you know Dave has said in terms of the generics, but I'm going to answer it slightly differently. Um, about probably about seven years ago, somebody came to have a chat with me about um, their career, and I couldn't understand their CV. I just couldn't put it together. And so when I met her, I said, I don't, I don't get what happened, you know, just explain it to me. And she'd forgotten or she had omitted to say that she had had three kids during this period. Um, and when I asked why, she said, well, it's probably best not to put that on my CV. Now, at this point, you know, when all the funders have a very clear statement in their application forms about telling us, tell us about, you know, times of absence, it seems extraordinary that somebody would not say that they had taken periods of maternity. Now, I use that as a comparator because I think that, in a way, some of the challenges that COVID is creating for particular groups in terms of research productivity and ability to engage is there, it, there are barriers, but the funders need to know about them. At the moment, we don't have a specific COVID question, but we do have opportunities for people to tell us about it, and we will take that into account. What we haven't figured out is quite how to do that in a way that is structured and GDPR compliant and all the rest of it. So it is a work in progress, but we really are thinking about it, and we are asking in a number of different ways 
in the hope that people will tell us how COVID has affected them so we can take that into account. If I, if I could just say a word from a sort of trainee perspective, I mean, I, I think it's I'm very reassured to hear you know, everyone saying about flexibility, because I think that's very important and, and, and a flexible approach to how it's impacted different people. Um, because I mean, certainly if, it, if this had happened at the same time in my training as it had, did have to pour, well, as I was recruiting a study of immunocompromised patients coming to, to a tertiary hospital centre, it would have completely decimated it and, and wiped out all my future research plan then I think it's quite good not to have a, a, a framework a sort of um, prescriptive framework for everyone and, and taking it on a case-by-case -case basis because clearly it will affect different people to different amounts and it's good to hear you know you and Dave saying those things and understanding that it will impact people in different ways and taking that into account in terms of outputs during the period. I wonder if Paul had any reflections on what he's heard about the impact on research careers going forward. Uh, again, I'm just uh, very reassured by everything that's been said tonight. Uh, when COVID first started to have an impact on my research, there was some nights that I was really quite worried about the direction that my research was going and what impact that would have on my career. Uh, but I, again, everybody, the, my supervisors, uh, funders, everybody's been actually very, very supportive. And it sounds from what I'm hearing tonight is that these things will be taken into account into the future. So uh, again, I, I feel very reassured about that. And uh, hopefully it shouldn't have too, too much of an impact uh, on things moving forward. I mean, we surveyed um, the, the trainees to find out the scale of the impact. And actually, for the vast majority of people were able to continue with some aspects of work related to their project whilst doing additional clinical work. So it, a small number of people had no impact at all. Um, a, a large group of people had some impact, but were continuing. And there is a group of people, we have to be honest, where I mean, a little bit, as Ken said, where it has wiped a project out. And I think... Um, you know, I know people have lost mouse colonies and things like that built up over time. And so I think we, we need to be aware that's happened. And I think what we're um, keen to do is is for, for people not to automatically look for extensions, because I think people can adapt. And we but we will think about that where people have been really badly affected. And there are a relatively small number of people. And I think for most people, research training is about flexibility and adaptability and responding to situations. I I'm less worried about careers with all of this. And I think over the medium to long term, I think people will have gained experience and skills from this to do. They've learned something about themselves. And we hear that from the clinicians all the time. But it will potentially mean that that you do things differently over a short a short time, um, but the medium to longer term. But all of us towards the end of our careers would tell you that all careers are written in hindsight anyway. Um, so what seems like a seamless passage from role to role to role is all mythical. It's all written in hindsight. And, you know, when you're early on in your career, you do go off in different directions. So I think it's it is um, making the most of it um, in a framework that is supportive about you. But, you know, I can make complete sense of my career. But it, when I was doing it, it did feel completely random. I probably shouldn't say that when this is being recorded. It was all entirely planned. Fantastic. I, I, I'm just wondering if we could sort of canvas the panel's opinion. I imagine quite a few of the people watching this webinar will be thinking about going out into research or thinking about applying for, for fellowships um, in 2021. And and sometimes the the option is there to defer. And, and I wonder whether people have got an idea about whether they would apply for the net, their PhD funding in January or whether they'd defer it till next year, given the impact that it's had on a large number of people's research. I think it probably depends on your on your projects um, to an extent, but it also if the opportunity is there, it may not still be there in six months, nine months, 12 months time. So uh, I think sometimes you've just got to seize the opportunity and, and go with it. And it's about sort of understanding being realistic, I guess, in what you can achieve over these next few months, but hopefully, you know, this time next year, um, we may be in a much better position then to, um, to, to move forward. So I, I would still, personally, I would still go for it um, if the opportunity was there. So I, I, I think my response would be very similar. Um, 
I think you have to ask yourself, well, you need to talk to your potential supervisor. You know, is there a reason why it wouldn't be sensible? Is there an argument for delaying, whether it's around mice or clini a particular clinical study? But also ask yourself the question, well, if I wasn't going for it now, what would be the impact down the line? What would I be doing instead of this? You know, because sometimes, um, uh, uh, as uh, Kenneth has just said, it, it is the right time. And what you need is a plan B. You know, if I couldn't start my mouse experiments on day one, what would I do instead? Uh, just think it through. Uh, I would agree completely. I think there's a right time. Personally, for people, um, it, there's a, an opportunity when it comes along. There's an opportunity in the science. And I think maybe if people have, you know, perhaps been in a CL post or something like that, it'll all be about the kinetics of papers where papers from your PhD have come out and you're at the right point to do it. So I think over the longer term, things will even out. And, and because there's such a long lead time from thinking about a, an application through to starting the research, I would carry on. Um, doing what's the right thing for you and for the for the science. Thank you. That's very helpful. I mean, I, I had sort of thoughts along the same lines actually that we should just get on and 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 carry on as best as possible. And I, I would imagine that hopefully a, a lot of the problems that we've had will be over by the sort of mid of next year. Charlotte. So just for one final round of questions, we've had questions both before the seminar in preparation for it and online that are asking for some comments and some feedback from the panel about the potential disproportionate impact of COVID on women and people with caring responsibilities. I think Sarah's answered some of this. Um, and I suspect a lot of the answers are the same, but the two specific areas that have come up are around Athena Swan. Um, and obviously many of us are aware that Athena Swan um, has been abolished by the government as part of their review of bureaucracy um, and the impact that that might have on people uh, who are applying for fellowships and the prioritization of people with caring fellowships and gender disparity, but also around the need to look after children disproportionately falling to women and someone cited a study that's highlighted that most of the big papers published in COVID, there was an even lesser number of women involved in the authorship than that, than there would be expected normally. Um, and I just wondered if there were some reflections from the panel about that. Um, so I can comment. Um, the So I think the, the, the issues around Athena Swan are not around the principles which are absolutely held. It was about the fact that um, it was a very bureaucratic exercise. And I think um, if if we're honest, um, there were issues where the interest of women were not being looked after by organisations and those organisations were all proud of their Athena Swan silver status. And a letter went out to um, all your universities yesterday um, about how we expect people in academic training to be looked after in the future and, and a fair deal for people. So Athena Swan became, um, the principle was fantastic, it had a real effect, but it actually ended up being gamed too much if we're, if we're honest, but the principle is there. There is something else which is going to emerge fairly shortly, which is every all the funders on this call and others were involved in commissioning a piece of research around the issues and challenges um, for women in academia. And that is going to report fairly shortly. And we are looking at implementable um, uh, recommendations from that. And it's very powerful stuff that echoes what you're saying. And so we will be looking at really important and effective and implementable steps around supporting women and then other groups in academic pathways. And I think for us, um, and I'm sure I speak for everybody, that when we talk about COVID impact, we do not talk about just people going onto the clinical front line. It is everybody who has been impacted at all by all of the life events that went on around COVID. So we do not distinguish in the nature of the impact. It is just the impact. And, and we are genuinely interested to hear all of the impacts that people have. So we, the funders in the training space are going to have our own, really, I think quite eye-catching steps around supporting people in the academic pathway from all groups. And I think one of the things I say to people all the time is careers, um, 
life is a marathon, not a sprint. And it's really important that we support able people um, throughout their careers to realize their potential. And I think we, we made some changes to our advanced fellowships around flexibility and the, the increase in strong female applications has been quite eye catching by simple changes around flexibility and, you know, honest awareness of the challenges people face. So don't worry about the move away from Athena Swan. It was simply to stop it being a game and turn it back to the principles that are actually important. Sarah, I think you might be on mute. Sorry, that was the first time this evening. Um, I, I, just to follow on from what Dave, Dave has said is that um, underrepresented groups and trying to increase the percentage of underrepresented groups within academia is really important to all the funders. And I think that, um, as Dave said, we've commissioned a piece of work around women and, and fall off at transition points and how important um, providing a safety net at those points may be to help people get across to the next step. And I think that th this is embedded in really all the schemes um, that are on offer and certainly from a welcome perspective it's one thing that we are constantly uh, thinking about how do we improve our reach and how do we increase flexibility but also increase visibility so that people feel that they will be welcomed within the academic community and that is the major challenge for us going forward if it's a challenge for the funders hopefully people will be seeing the effect on the ground. Brilliant, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to James now, who's going to draw the session to a close. Yes, that just really leaves me to thank um, everybody for uh, participating in the seminar. Um, we're incredibly grateful to you for your time and, and your very cogent advice. Um, the, if anyone has any questions, then please uh, email the email address on this, this slide here. And um, if people could also fill in the uh, the survey when that gets emailed out, that would be great because it would be fantastic to try and improve this for the next um, webinar. So that just leaves me to thank everybody for, um, for, for participating in the seminar and for sending us in excellent questions.